So once you accept that this is how these decays happen, then sure, they are explained. So the question is, well, why do they have to be that way? Why couldn't the decay of the charged pion happen through electromagnetic decay? So this is where this principle comes in very useful in particle physics. If, uh, um, what's the adage? I think it goes, whatever is not forbidden is mandatory. It's a kind of saying in particle physics, it's really related to the context where you are looking at many, many, many interactions. Billions, trillions, numbers so large that I don't, no longer have prefixes. In fact, the goal of building particle accelerator is to have as many collisions as possible. So because you have so many large inter number of interactions happening, if you have even 0.001% or if you have non-zero percent chance of something happening, you will see it happen. Um, so, um, so whenever particle physicists see something not happening, like here, they never see a charged pion decaying by electromagnetic interaction. What they would say is, well, it must be forbidden somehow. Somehow, it must not be possible for this decay to happen by um, electromagnetic force at all. And how do you prove that something is impossible? Because it's uh, usually pretty easy to prove that something is possible. You just do it, then you have proven that it's possible. <laughs> Somebody tells you that you can never get an A, so you study hard and you prove to them that you can, <laughs> you can get an A. But like if someone actually wants to prove to you that, oh wait, that's, this is not a bad example. Uh, this is not a good example. But if you want to prove that something is uh, impossible, that's actually a much harder thing to prove. Because um, people say you can't prove a negative. Well, you can prove a negative in the scientific context. You need an entire framework of theory to show that something that doesn't happen, not only simply doesn't happen, it's also impossible for it to happen. And the framework we are going to work with is conservation laws. Because in this context, we don't really actually know a lot of physics. We don't even know a lot about weak interaction. But what we do know are conservation laws. So these are things that we believe, based on our observation, are um, quantities that must be conserved. So if whatever interaction or reaction requires a violation of this quantity, then this is where we can say, without having actually looked through 10 to the 20 interactions, we can say, well, the interaction you are proposing seems to violate this quantity, so we can say, that's not, um, um, that cannot happen because we believe in this conservation law more than there being an exception. So you already, we talked about this last time a little bit. So let me just uh, recap the conservation laws that we went over. So there's a conservation of energy and momentum. And this is how the conservation law plays a role in the context of particle decay. So in fact, this can be used to prove why, um, prove why electron must be stable. This is, some, uh, this is an absolute statement you can kind of prove in the context of what we know. Electron is absolutely stable, and later on we'll argue that proton is absolutely stable. Is neutron absolutely stable? No, neutron decays into proton and electron. Um, and the reason for that is neutron is a slightly, a very so slightly heavier than, heavier than proton. So uh, I'm looking at the wrong side. Um, all right, PDG. So let me bring up a baryon table. So summary tables, baryon table. When you look at the properties of proton and neutron, so this is the proton mass. Let's remember it correctly, 938.27 MeV. When you look up neutron, it's very similar, except it's a little bit heavier. It's 939.565 MeV. So it's heavier by a little bit, like by one MeV, I think. Heavier by about a little bit more than one MeV. So 
So why is it impossible for proton to decay into a neutron and positron? Not enough energy, right? Yeah. If it's decaying, then it's a rest frame. This rest energy is all it has. So it, it doesn't have enough energy to decay into neutron. But when you look at neutron, neutron has enough energy to decay into proton and electron. So this is one conservation law. And in fact, this can be used to rule out a lot of decay interactions. Question? You might think, yeah, you might think, uh, so you might think a proton might be able to decay into electron and positron. Now, the thing is, we never see proton actually decaying into electron and positron, right? So let's, uh, um, so that's where we have to now start introducing the idea of additional conservation laws to explain why proton never decays into electron and positron, even though it has so many opportunities to decay into electron and positron. So, um, but this is a starting point, energy and momentum. This is something you're familiar with. And we also talked about conservation of angular momentum. So, and uh, we talked about conservation of electric charge. And I've been actually using conservation of electric charge without explicitly mentioning it just now, because I was suggesting if a proton were to decay, it might decay into neutron and positron, because I'm subconsciously trying to conserve electric charge. Yeah? So this is all the conservation laws that you know from, um, from physics 4A and 4B. And really, last time, I just threw this additional conservation law at you. But the reason that those conservation laws are there is to exactly explain what Javier just pointed out. So, you know, if we're in particle physics, anything that is not forbidden is mandatory, then you must see it happening at some point. Why is it that we never see proton decaying into electron and positron? Or, you know, I think a, a muon is light enough that proton could have decayed into muon and antimuon or you know, electron and antimuon, like why does that never happen? And this is where the idea of um, additional quant conserved quantum numbers come in. So to explain why there is such a thing as a stable baryon, they, people, ev even though we have enough energy, people came up with this idea. They are, uh, baryon number is conserved. Oh, I guess I could just spell out number. So baryon number is conserved, right? And they would assign proton and neutrons with a baryon number. Let's just say, to fit with all the observations so far, say that proton and neutron each has baryon number of one. That explains why neutron can decay into, um, that explains why neutron can decay into proton, because that would conserve baryon number. Um, then I guess here's another thing you can kind of look at. Um, here's one interaction that never happens. You would never have a neutron decay into proton and just the electron. Well, I guess, actually, I guess you don't know it that it never happens. Well, okay, so what we talked about in the beta decay is that, I don't know how, so I think people actually have looked for neutrino-less beta decay. Um, so at least based on that, I can say beta decay that doesn't involve neutrino, people have looked for it, and they've never found the evidence of it. And I'm kind of swapping the chronological order a little bit, but I think I, always been kind of upfront about me not following history all that well. Um, so in order to explain that, what you now need to explain is, conserve, what you now need to introduce is the conservation of lepton number. So the reason you would uh, introduce lepton number is to say, what, uh, say, for example, explain why this is the only way neutron can decay. When neutron decays into proton, it must produce an electron along with a proton in order to conserve electric charge. And the reason it must produce neutrino, technically antineutrino, is to in order to conserve lepton number. 
because electron um, it has assign it, assign it, you know, nah, assign it a electron number of one. Let the antiparticles carry the opposite of the number. Then you have lepton number one, lepton number minus one. They cancel out, so you have produced a zero net lepton. Yeah. So, so this is the paradigm that we are uh, working within. So, whenever we have an interaction that we might might expect to see, but somehow never happens, then we explain that by well the proposed interaction violates um, one of these conservation laws. That's why you don't see it happen. So looking back at pi meson, what you can say is, well, so with a neutral pi on, um, you, so you see it decaying into two photons, and everything there seems fine, right? No charge conservation is violated. Uh, nothing funny happens there. So. Here's then what you would uh, look for. Suppose that you had charged the pion. Then could this charged the pion decay in such a way that it doesn't produce a neutrino? All right. So let's just think through some of the possibilities. Mm. So. Let's uh, just to make it easier for ourselves. Let's say we had negatively charged the pion. What could it decay in? Uh, what are the, some of the possible particles it could decay into? So, I mean, obviously a muon. What other particles could it possibly decay into? Electron. Um, could it decay into a proton or a neutron? Why not? Sorry. Uh, okay, so maybe, maybe the what about positive pi, on? or maybe it decays into antiproton. So, but why couldn't it decay into antiproton? Yeah, conservation of energy and momentum. So whenever you are looking at a decay, you for one, you are looking for particles that are lighter than the particle you are looking for. So you are looking. All right, so it needs to decay into muon or electron. Now, it cannot decay into a single particle, then you couldn't conserve energy and momentum at the same time. It needs to decay into at least a two. So then you think, oh, then I think I'm going to have it decay into this, uh, muon plus a photon. What's wrong with that interaction, that decay? Yeah, lepton number. So, oh, I guess I probably should tell you this. The mesons, um, they have a zero baryon number. Well, it's not a baryon. And it has a zero lepton number. So just so as a matter of quantum numbers that people were assigning, mesons have zero baryon number and zero lepton number. So here, you start out with a zero lepton number. You ought to end with a zero lepton number. So you have produced a muon. Um, all right, then I guess we need an anti-lepton to, so what about if it's a muon and a positron? Yeah, now electric charge isn't satisfied. So what it turns out to be is that once you need to, once this decays into a lepton, you need an anti-lepton that's not charged. And the only anti-lepton that's not charged is neutrino. So the only way a charged pion could ever decay is by producing a neutrino. And that means it must involve a weak interaction. 